Okay, so um, <clears throat> we're going to we're going to finish up tonight. I was I was I did intend, or I was hopeful anyway, that I would be able to to uh, add one more segment on this on this little course. But uh, with my schedule and everything I got going on, because uh, I'll be back here in a couple of weeks as it is to teach another topic, and so I just don't have the time right now to uh, to get ready for that if I, if I take the time to do this next section. So anyway, we're gonna, we are gonna finish up everything that I had intended, for, everything is in your notes. We're gonna cover all of that. But just as a reminder, we started off with an introduction and, and just some things that were in key important views on how you view your Bible. That was first week. Then last week, we talked about the doctrine of preservation. We talked about the idea of what does it mean to be preserved? And, um, and I was gonna quote a verse that uh, Je Jeff Trude shared with me, and now I can't remember what the verse was. So um, it was in Isaiah, I believe. Was it in Isaiah? So if you could, uh, was that a text? Okay, let me see if I can find it real quick. Everybody turn to the book of, Jer of Isaiah. I don't see it, Jeff. Thank you. Isaiah 49, 8. This is just something that Jeff shared with me. I thought it was a good verse. I want to share with you. Uh, Isaiah 49, 8 says, Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee. And I will preserve thee and keep thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth to cause to inherit the desolate heritage. That's a really very specific statement, a very, very distinct promise from God that I will preserve thee. And as we were talking about it, about the concept of preservation this last week, um, using it as an illustration that God has preserved you as, you know, your, the gift of salvation is a preserving promise that your life is preserved in God, and so you're, you have life eternal. And so we talked about that. And what I want to talk about tonight is, is what I've entitled faulty texts. So in your notes, that's kind of where you want to pick up at is faulty texts. And, um, and so I want to just kind of start there. And we're going to, we're, before we get to the end tonight, we're going to do some verse by verse comparison of different texts, different, different, uh, different books, and look at and see just how crazy it is that the Word of God has been changed in, in these uh, critical texts. So anyway, if you recall, as we talked about uh, the, the first week and a little bit the second week, we talked about a, a thing called textual criticism. And if you, as you remember, hopefully you remember, and it is in that handout, uh, the definition of te textual criticism, the handout that I gave that are definitions. But just as a reminder, the textual criticism is an attempt by scholars to determine the Greek and the Hebrew text so as to arrive at what the original autograph might have said. So basically what they're doing is they're looking at the way the text was written. They're looking at the words that were used, the way the, the, uh, the author wrote these words, this is what we have in our Bible today. And then they're going back and they're looking. If you recall, I don't know if I can back up here or not. Let me see if I can go back far enough. Yeah, there it is. You remember... Um, Come on, get where I'm going. Yeah, here. Remember we talked about these, these samples of fragments of manuscripts that are evidence that, that, that are literally found, they have been found in, in architectural digs in different places, build, build, uh, old buildings that were explored throughout the Middle East. Uh, things like this were found. So textual criticism will, will look at the words that we have today and then try to backtrack to that. And then backtrack to, the, to the, what they would call the original. Remember, we don't have an original text. We don't have the original manuscript. We don't have the, the paper or the, or the, the uh, parchment or anything that was used as a writing surface. We don't have that from Paul or from Moses or from Isaiah or uh, any of those kind of writings. We don't have what we would quote, call the original documents. But the textual criticism is going to try to work their way back from where we're at to try to reproduce what would have been 
in their mind, the original. Now, I say that in their mind because they're, they don't know. So they're like, they're researching this and studying this out, and they're getting to the point where they go, okay, I'm pretty sure this is what the original said. I'll show you a very classic example of that here in just a few minutes. Uh, and so since the first copies are no longer in existence, if we want to translate from the original language, we have to first determine the text from the copies available to us today. Two, there's two philosophies. Let me get back to where we start at today. There's two philosophies um, that, uh, that I want to point out first. There are two philosophies of what we would call textual criticism. There are two, there's two sides. There's a, remember we had two, two lines of two cities, two texts, two lines of Bibles and stuff. We had two, two philosoph philosophical views on textual criticism. This, this is the first one. The true text has never, has never been lost, but it has been preserved. Yes, sir. Well, they still worked. <laughs> okay. I knew that's what you meant. Isaiah 59, 21. Okay, let's look at that real quick. Isaiah 59, verse 21. Thanks for correcting that. Okay, Isaiah 59, verse 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth forever. Okay, so that's a generational promise that he's making in this passage of Scripture regarding his word. My spirit is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, from your, from your, your, your uh, offspring's mouth, from their um, offspring's mouth all the way forever, henceforth. So that the word of God is preserved uh, all the way from the beginning. Okay, so back here to this study. So the first thing about, about a philosophy of textual criticism, the first philosophy is this. The true text has never been lost, but it has been preserved. So the true text, the true text then was faithfully preserved, and we went through this last week uh, on the doctrine of preservation. We talked about the, the, uh, um, the, the steps, the sequence of steps from the, the priest um, to the, to the uh, church, uh, uh, how, that was, how the Bible was preserved. So the true text is faithfully preserved by the priesthood of believers down through the centuries. And then it's this method, this method of, of the, that we talked about, uh, this textual criticism is a, in, in this method, the idea of textual criticism would be, I would re refer to as a pure science with the goal of finding out what has been preserved continually in an unbroken line of succession, even as that verse we read. In fact, I'm going to make a note of that verse right there. Um, Isaiah 59, 21. Yeah. Okay. So it's believed, uh, it believes in the supernatural, it trusts in God overriding providence, and it observes the hand of the Holy Spirit throughout history. That's, that actually goes very well with that verse. Thank you for that, Jeff. But there's an alternative. I would say, or, or okay, so it's either, either the true text has never been lost. So what does that mean for you? If the true text has never been lost, if the true text has never been lost, what does that do for you? That means that you need to find out where it's located. You need to find out where it's located, and I'm going to give you everything you need to point right at the true text that's available to you today. In fact, you have it hopefully on your lap, and that's the King James Bible. That is the true text. Or, or the text is part of an evolutionary process continuing even today. Now, we know what evolutionary processes look like, well, or what they scientists say it looks like, that so one thing begat another thing, which is sort of like the original, but is different. And then that begets something else. And so, you know, uh, features that are like, like a giraffe, for example. One day a giraffe thought, I need a longer neck. And produced a giraffe with a longer neck. And I don't know how he produced a longer neck for himself, because he starved to death, because he couldn't get to the top of the tree. But anyway, that's the idea of evolution, right? It's just changes. It's a process that continues every day. The modern philosophy of textual criticism, which would be this, is that the true text 
is a product of evolutionary process that, that is not even over yet today. That the Bible is constantly being changed, evolved, and that's why you have so many different versions. It's evolving all the time. Which, which philosophy do you align to? For me, it's the first one. The true text has never been lost, but it, was been, it has been preserved because we have verses like the, that we just read, Isaiah 50, 59, verse 21, as a, promise of, as a promise of that. But it can't be evolving all the time because if it's evolving all the time, how do I know that what I have is what I'm supposed to have today? And how do I know, how can I, how can I know that the people that came 100 years ago had what they needed 100 years ago and, it, and what I have is not different? I mean, there, if it was evolving, then what they had wasn't good enough. Now I had to have something. So you get, you get kind of weird in the ev evolutionary concepts. Uh, let me read it. Uh, I have a quote. I don't know if it's in your notes, but I have a quote that I want to show you here by a guy by the name of Bruce Metzger. Uh, Bruce Metzger wrote a book called Detectual Commentary on the Greek New Testament. And this is what he said. It's a long quote. Is that in your notes? No. Okay. Well, hopefully you can see it on the screen. During about 14 centuries, when the New Testament was transmitted in handwritten copies, numerous changes and accretions, the word accretion means errors, numerous errors came into the text of approximately 5,000 Greek manuscripts of all or part of the New Testament that are known today, no two agree exactly in all the particulars. Confronted by a mass of conflicting readings, editors must decide. Editors must decide which variants deserve to be included in the text. Now, those textual editors, those are the ones that sell you your Bible at Mardell's. Those are the textual editors. Those are the ones that put that Bible together and say, no, this is the right Bible. No, this is the right Bible. Well, no, we're going to change it. This, in, in 2023, we'll have a new Bible. That'll be the right Bible and things like that. He goes on and he says, uh, textual scholars have developed certain generally accepted criteria of evaluation. These considerations depend upon probabilities, and sometimes the textual critic must weigh one set of probabilities against another. And since textual criticism is an art, as well as a science, it's inevitable that in some cases, different scholars will come to different evaluations of the significance of the evidence. Well, I would agree with that. They don't, they, none of them talk the same language. But here's the thing. If textual criticism is an art, as well as a science, then there's no objective, externally verifiable accountability to what the text, textual critic produces. There's no, there, if, if, if they get to, if it's an art, well, but, okay, so here's the thing. You can't, you can critique art. I don't like that art. I don't like that painting. I don't like that drawing. I don't, you know, you can, I don't like that song. You can say all of that, but that doesn't make it wrong. The drawing, the song, the painting, the, the, the book, doesn't make it wrong just because you don't like it the artist gets to decide what is right, not the person that is receiving the art. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Are you tracking with me? In the arc? I hope so, because I, I want you to get this, because this is important tonight. Uh, and so, the, therefore, if that's the case, that, a, that it's, a, it's a art as, a, as much as it is a science, then prejudices of the translators who are now touching the text are justified. Their prejudice is justified because they're the artist. They get to make it, they get to uh, change it the way they want because, well, they're the artist. I mean, if you wanted to paint a, a paint the picture of Picasso, well, we would know it wasn't Picasso because you wouldn't paint it the same way he did. But who's to say yours is wrong? I mean, you're the artist. You can say, no, 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 mine is an exact replica of a Picasso painting. You see how that works? With the, as the artist... As the, uh, the scientists and the artists, you get to make the call. But that's not what happened with the history of what we call the traditional text. By 1633, the scholars had come to the same evaluation of the evidence, so much so that in the space of 160 printed editions since 1516, they were able to deliver to the world, quote unquote, the, the text received by all with nothing changed or corrupted. That's what, that's the statement that's made does anybody have in, your, in the front of your Bible the, uh, uh, the letters to the editor, or the, I'm sorry, the letter to the king and the, the letters to the reader? These are two, you got them? If you haven't, if you've never read that, uh, the, the, pistol, the dedicatory to the king, that's a very short, you know, it's like page and a half. 
And then the uh, letter to, from, the, uh, from the editors of the King James Bible to the reader, it's like 20 pages, but you should read it because they talk about that. They, and they'll say that, that kind of stuff even there. And so here's the point. The, 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 um, because people can make it do whatever they want, there's a, there's a fancy word for this. I get to decide what it is. And that's the, called the eclectic text. The eclectic text. The modern method of textual criticism has resulted in, and I've, I've told you this before, the United Bible Societies, and it's actually the fourth edition of the Greek New Testament. And there's another Greek Testament called the Nestle, as in the candy bar, Nestle, uh, Allen, Nestle Allen text, the 27th edition. So all modern texts either use the U U UBS, the United Bible Society's fourth edition Greek text, or they use the Nestle Allen text, the 27th edition. The modern method of textual criticism is called the eclectic, eclect, eclectic method, meaning that they pick and choose from various sources about what the Bible should say. The author, the editor, the artist, the scientist, he gets to pick. He, is, he uses an eclectic method. Oh, I'll choose this, I'll choose it. It's like when you go to a buffet. You go to a buffet, you, you load your plate up differently than I load my plate up. Is your plate wrong? Or is my plate wrong? Oh, they're both the same. They're full of food. So that's the eclectic method. Think about that next time you go to a, 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 a buffet someplace. Okay, so I want to show you some pictures. I think these pictures are in your note because you won't be able to read them on the screen. Are they in there? They got pictures, little square pictures, a bunch. Let me see that. Okay, you, okay thank you. I'm glad you got that because I was like, oh, you got to have this. Okay, so the modern method of textual criticism has resulted in, like I said, the UBS 4th edition or the Nestle Allen 27th edition. So on the fourth, on the page 480, this is an example, just one simple random example. On page 480 of the uh, UBS text, it shows us the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 6 to 13. So let me just point real quick up here. All of this stuff up here is the Greek text starting in verse, in chapter, in verse 6. There's verse 11, and there's verse 13. And the word 12 is in there someplace. There, there's 12. Okay, so that's the Greek text. But I got this, this line right here highlighted in red. Okay, that's a significant line we'll talk about. It. Actually, the guy that taught me this, he called it the line of despair. When you drop below the line of despair, you'll find out that it's despairing what's there. Uh, and so listed below this line are the, what's called the variant readings of the Greek manuscripts and which manuscripts they adopted to make that text to say it the way that they wanted to say it. So let me see if I can click through this. So, okay, so that's all the variant readings right there. Down here, the variant readings. So it's like up here, there'll be a little, a little superscript number up here, and, and I know it's someplace in... Verse 12, I think. Anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. But you'll see that there's, here's, here's verse 10, verse 12, and verse 13 have, have comments, footnotes, if you will, about that verse. And so you'll notice that each, each variant in the, like right here, whoop, it went, went too far. Okay. You notice here in verse 10, there's a B right there. Verse 12 is a D, underlined red. And verse 13 is a D. Let me back up a second. So a reading with an A means that they're pretty sure, they would say maybe 95% sure that, the, that the, the word that they chose for those verses came from a particular manuscript that I showed you, those, those fragments, came from one of those. They're, they're, they're saying... We got this verse from that, that piece of fragment manuscript, and they, and they identify it in the text. Okay, but verse A, if it's an A, it's, it's, they're pretty sure that it's what the original said. If it's a B, they're a little bit less certain. If it's a C, they're fairly uncertain. And if it's a D, it's anybody's guess which manuscript that came from. 
Okay, but that's not even all of it. Right here is the D on verse 12. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, or Acts chapter 16, verse 12 real quick. Let's just see what it says, because I can't read Greek. Acts chapter 16 and verse 12. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony, and we were in this city certain days. So the travels of Paul and his, and his men are mentioned in chapter 16, verse 12. But notice that chapter, six, chapter 16, verse 12 is a D. What did we say a D was? We don't really know what it is or where it came from. Okay, but here's, here's something else. Notice right here that circle? And in the circle, I don't know if you can see it in your notes, but there's a, a two letters, CJ. CJ. You know what CJ means? Conjecture. You know what conjecture means? They made it up. So United Bible Society text to make a new Bible out of, to use that Bible, to make a, to use that text to make a Bible, some of the verses they made it up. Now you tell me, why would I want a Bible that was made off of something that was made up by an artist? Is that a Bible that you would want to read out of? Would you want to read Acts chapter 16, verse 12, verse 14, or verse 12, I'm sorry, and not know that that's actually what happened in historical timeline on Paul's life? You know, we could say, well, maybe they made it up and said in verse 12, instead of, instead of, from thence to Philippi, which is the bum city. Maybe, maybe that's the better word for it. Maybe, maybe Philippi is just a pl bad place to go instead of a chief city. You know? So we kind of we paint a picture differently by changing one word. I don't know if that's the word that's been changed, but I'm just using that as an example. So uh, making Philippi be a chief city, a special city, a, va a valuable city, one that you want to go to with the gospel because it will impact all the regions all around. But if it's, a, if it's just a dump city, man, eh, Paul, Paul's just going to keep right on trucking past it and keep right on going. He probably won't even go through. He'll go around on the, on the bypass and keep on going. Does that make sense? Isn't that amazing? So I don't have the names with me right now because this is a section that's come out of my manuscript evidence class in HBI. But I have the name of the five men that included above the line the text reading for which there is not a single Greek manuscript. I know their names. I've got them written down. We talk about that in, in, the, in the HBI class. I don't, want to, I don't want to give you all those names right now. But it's an amazing thing. There were five men, five guys. I guess you could call them artists, scientists, that they decided this is what the Bible is going to say. And they made, it, they made it say it in the United Bible Society Greek text which is used to create a lot of different Bibles. Okay, so let me see where we're at here. CJ means conjecture. Conjecture means they made it up. So the Bible-believing Christian, which will hopefully would be all of you, you need to understand that there are, what are the alternatives if, we don't, if we're not going to go with a, a, a text that has not been lost but has been preserved? What do we got? So the choice is not, here's the, here's the key thing. See, the choice is not between the King James Bible and the 500 other versions that are out there. That's, that's, not, what we're cho that's, not, that's not our choice. The choice is not the King James Bible and the NIV. And the choice is not the King James Bible versus the ESV or any of those other. The, the choice is, are you going to use, are you going to use the United Bible Society text, Greek text, or are you going to use the Textus Receptus, which makes, so you, you have two choices. The standard is not the King James Bible and the New American Standard or, or any of those stuff. The choice is between the ASV, or I'm sorry, the AV, the authorized version, the King James Bible, or the USB, UBS text. That's your choice. So when you go and buy a Bible, you're choosing between the King James Bible and the US, UBS text. The King James Bible did not use the US, UBS, United Bible Society text. Didn't use it. And just so you know, you can actually find... These, these Greek texts online, you can, uh, I don't know if you, if you want to get them, you're welcome to, but you can get them. So because all of the modern language versions are translated from the modern 
eclectic Greek text. Eclectic means they made it up. They chose whatever they wanted. Um, so because the modern language versions are translated from the modern electic, eclectic Greek text produced by five men with humanistic presuppositions who made it up the word of God as they went along, these five men, I actually do have their names here. These five men are the editors of the Greek New Text. It's Kirk Allen, Matthew Black, Carl, Carlo Martini, Bruce Metzger, and Alan Wick, Wickren, Wickren, something like that. So those are the guys that decided what, what words are going to go in your Bible if you're not going to use a King James Bible. Those are the men. They, they are the ones that put this thing together in present day time. Most of these guys are still alive. In the case of the modern Greek text, choosing from the manuscript evidence on one hand and from subjective biases and prejudices of five men sitting in judgment of the word of God on the other hand, that's your choice. Because after all, textual criticism is a science and an art. See, I mean, we, we can't argue that. Uh, yeah, we can. When we, I do all the time. That's what this is about. Okay, so the Philadelphian text, the Philadelphian church, sorry. The Philadelphian church, that was uh, the sixth of the churches that, that are mentioned in the book of Revelations, chapter 2 and 3. Uh, it was the sixth church. And it was a powerful church because the Bible said that they kept the word. See, now we're laid to see in time frame, but what we don't want is, is Heartland Baptist Fellowship to be a laid to see in church, which means that all we're concerned about the rights of the people, we're concerned about our rights, and this is the right way to do it, and, this is, and we want to, we're concerned about what God said. So the Philadelphian church, they're the ones that preserved it for so long. They guarded it by careful scholarship to find out which church had, had actually accepted and which Christians had actually believed in they, 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 the right down to memory. So some of these texts, the UBS texts, even First John chapter five verse seven. I think I mentioned this last week. Is not even mentioned. It's not, it's not even included in a lot of modern texts. First John five seven. I think I read that last week. Um, as it go, um, the Spirit, the Word, and the. They bear witness, of, these three bear witness. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, Revelation 3.10 says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, Jesus Christ speaking to the church of Philadelphia, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee, preservation, from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So the modern Laodicean church is lukewarm, because we have allowed the men with the scholarship and no spirituality to steal from, right from under our noses what the Bible has to say. These men attempt to justify themselves on the basis of that they claim no major doctrines. This is what they'll say. No major doctrines have been changed, and we're going to prove that out here tonight. They say no major doctrines have been changed by the words that have been changed. But in fact, words and doctrine have been changed. You know what it says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19, and I hope you do know what it says. It says, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. God says, don't mess with my word. Don't, don't add to it. Don't take it away. Don't play artsy craftsy with it. Don't mess with my word. Don't add, don't take. Leave it alone. The most important doctrine, the most important doctrine that, that of bibliology and preservation and dependence upon God is uh, as providentially capable to guard the word he gave us, that's all destroyed when you throw out uh, preservation of the Bible. The most important doctrine is destroyed. Bibliology, meaning the study of the Bible, preservation, dependence upon it, and so on. The words, the words, does that say that the words? I don't know where I'm, I hope I'm in, still in the right place. Okay, good. I can't read that screen back there. Um, okay, so the, um, the, the, where am I at? Oh, yeah. The words, now let me just say this, not the concepts or not the thoughts, but the actual words are the key to the Bible. 
Every word is important enough to God that it is, if, you, it's, if you remove it, bears the penalty of eternal death. Every word, not his thoughts, not, not what it will. I think he might have meant this. Now, we're not, that's not where we're going. We're going with the exact words. Our initial biblical presupp- pres- 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 presuppositions will only support these. Remember, we, talked, we started talking about that at the very beginning, of presuppositions. Uh, this is the Word of God. It's been preserved. It's, not, it's never been lost. It's there. It's exactly what God wants us to have, and so on. We talked about those. You can go back in your notes and look at that. Our most important, our initial presuppositions support these conclusions that the text of the Bible was preserved, not corrupted, that it was only waiting to be found. It was waiting to be found by men like Erasmus and Stephanus and Beza and, El, and the El, 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 El Xavier brothers. Um, those are key, those are important names that we don't have time to even stu- get down into t- tonight or this study. But those are key men. It, and, uh, um, our initial prepositions or presuppositions also say that the Bible was not reconstructed by men like Westcott and Hort and Metzger and Allen and Black and Martini and Wilkin. We, we, don't, we don't let those guys get into our Bible. The naturalistic approach to the transmission of the text results in a Bible with the words of God corrupted by the addition and subtraction forbidden in Revelation 22. So let's summarize by saying our real problem with all modern traditions is threefold. We have three problems with modern Bible. I think this is in your notes. Number one, they are not a product of the operation of the Holy Spirit through the priesthood of believers. The new text, the new modern text was created by the print houses, by the Bible, by publishing houses. They created that. They, they, they took the United Bible Society text. They got a bunch of people together. They translated it into English and they printed it and then they sold it because it was about money. There will still be a demand for scholarship in the in the uh, uh, in in even this century and, and and going forward, but there was indifference as to the spirituality of the translators. The committees preparing the rev- RV, the revised version, could summon the help of any person eminent of scholarship to whatever to whatever nation or religious body they want they might belong. Now we didn't even get into how the the King James Bible. And this is actually a reference to that section we're not going to be able to talk about. But there was one of the things that I explained in the study of the King James Bible, and I think I said it last week, that the, they would, that the, uh, this, the men that translated the King James Bible was divided up into three groups, Oxford, Cambridge, and um, I don't remember the third place. I think it was, what's that big cathedral in England? Um Westminster, yes, thank you. I think that that's where the three were at. And they broke them up into groups. There were 54 men. They broke them up into three teams, and each team was broken up into two sub-teams. And they translated. They took a portion of the Scripture, and they worked on translating. And then they would pass it around. They would go, okay, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in group one, team B. I'm going to give mine to group two, team A, and we're going to rotate it around until I get every verse that I have. I have looked at every verse, and I've concurred with all of my colleagues that this is the right version. But that's not how it happened with the, with the, uh, the revised version and other versions like that. Um, they'd let anybody, doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter if they were uh, trained or knew the Bible, had, had a Bible background or anything. It didn't matter what nation they came from or what religious body. And that's important because they would inject false doctrine because of a religious background that they already had. So therefore, they were only they would they were they were able to invite a Roman Catholic and a Unitarian to work on the revision, and this affected the translation. So you want you want Baptists working on your translation, or do you want Catholics working on your translation, or do you want Unitarians or that kind of a group? Uh, for example, in Romans chapter five, verse Romans chapter nine, verse five, the author, turn over to Romans chapter nine, verse five, real quick. We we'll just I don't want to get too far past what's being said there. Romans chapter 9, verse 5. Who are the fathers of whom are, as concerning the flesh, Christ came who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. 
So the AV concludes with Christ came who is over all, God bless forever. In a marginal note, in the revised version of 1881, it declares that the text could be read in such a way that the phrase God bless him forever be separated from Christ. So it would say, Christ came, no, yeah, Christ came, but who's blessed forever? We don't know. They disconnected that in the verse. This was an attempt to question the deity of Christ. What we find today in the RSV of 1952 is that this note has become the actual test, text. So basically they had a footnote in the 1881 version, they had a little footnote. Then, then by, by we get to the time we get to uh, 1952, that footnote became the actual text of the verse. The, the uh, TEV, uh, I don't remember what TEV stands for, but that's the good news for modern man Bible. It's even worse. Several times the phrase death of Christ is substituted for the, the blood of Christ. So this is a rejection of the doctrine of the sacrificial atonement of Christ. By taking the blood out of the verse, you no longer, no, no, no longer have the, the, uh, your, your atonement was through the shed blood of Christ. That's number one. That's one product or one of them because they didn't use the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit through the priesthood of believers. Number two, they had a faulty text to translate from. You have a faulty text to translate from. And so I have the word uh, Anglicization. Uh, of the text. Anglicization means to make it English. Basically, they took the text and they just made it English. It's a difference between two competing philosophies. The question of Anglicization is important from the standpoint of verbal inspiration. The form in which God gave his word is important. And so Anglicization changes the form of the word that God had given. Modern Bibles tend to translate the Hebrew and the Greek into, to, into today's slang with more idiomatic English expressions. The AV was, was to be, and the, the phrase is as consonant, meaning neutral, as neutral, as consonant as it can be to the original Hebrew and Greek, to the best of their ability, because they don't have the original Hebrew and Greek. The modern translator, on the other hand, doesn't want his work to be recognizable as, as a translation at all. They just want it to be what they claim it to be. It should only be changed minimally. The Bible should only be changed minimally, minimally in the translation. It's not proper to change the revelation of God to suit modern English. There's a lot of people out there that want to take the King James Bible. That's what the new King James Bible was supposed to do, was to take the King James Bible words and make them friendly to the English of the 21st century. Well, the 20th century at the time, that's when it came out. And so we can't have that. Number three, they have a false philosophy of translating work. And we've talked about their work already. So I won't spend a lot of time here. But the humanistic concept of truth, is, it is relative and not absolute. That's the humanistic concept. Everything, truth is, absolute, is not absolute. Truth is relative. And so the same concept of relativism, relativism is found in the modern methods of translating the scriptures. The English Bible has a great history, but its future looks dim, and this is why. American Christians are so short-sighted, unfortunately, I hate to say this about us, but it's true. American Christians are so short-sighted that they want a translation that suits them best, rather than a translation that says what God wants it to say. Most discuss How do you feel about that? Do you want a Bible that what makes, makes you feel good? Or do you want a Bible that speaks to you from God? That's what I want. I want a Bible that I can trust. It's, this is God speaking to me. I tell everybody when I'm teaching, especially when I teach 1 Timothy, I'll just tell you too, maybe you can do this. Maybe, you, maybe you've done this kind of thing already. But I don't look at 1 Timothy as 1 Timothy. I look at it as 1 Randy. So that, I mean, that's how personal it is to me. And I really do that with, all, with everything. All the writing is, is to me. It's, this is a personal book that God wrote to me. I want his words. I don't, want, I don't want you to write me a letter that my wife had written me. You take her letter and you change the words around and give it to me. So this is from Julie. I don't want that. I want her letter. That makes sense? Okay. All right. So let me get, keep going here. Um. So since minor points can be raised against any translation, it's no wonder that Christianity today has shrugged their shoulders and said, ah, it makes no difference to me what translation you use. Just use whatever you want. 
Therefore, we focus on the philosophy of translation by which a version must be tested. Okay, so I think the next section, I hope I'm in the right. How should we, it says not translate, but I think that should say, how should we translate the word of God? So you can scratch out the word not. How should we? Okay, so there's a couple of terms that are important to grab a hold of. The first one is dynamic equivalence. I think that's a blank. The philosophy of dynamic equivalence. Now, this is, this is another area that just, just rocked me when I, when I was studying this out. And like, well, that can't be. That can't, that can't happen in my Bible. So just as there's two competing lines of text today, the received text versus the Westcott and Hort line of Greek text, there's also two competing translation methodologies. One is literal or formal, and the other is dynamic or dynamic equivalency. So the next blanks for you is the words formal or literal equivalence focuses attention on the message in both form and content, and it attempts to ensure the message in the receptor language should match as closely as possible the different elements in the source language. That is a lot of words, but basically that's the best choice. Formal and literal translation. So your King James Bible is a literal translation of the original text as much as they can get to it. Opposite of that is called dynamic. And not, that's a long paragraph. I'm not sure if I want to read all it to you. But anyway, it aims to, uh, to compete, to complete naturalness of expression and tries to relate the receptor to the modes of behavior. So basically dynamic Dynamic takes the, takes, a con, takes the content of whatever they're translating, Bible in this case, and they, make it, they want to make it fit the current culture. That's dynamic. They make it fit the current culture. You know how many times I've heard people, and you probably have too, well, the Bible is too old for us to, it doesn't have any relevance today. It doesn't speak to me today. I'm a 21st person, 21st century person, and I need the Bible to speak to me. So let's write a Bible that speaks to me, and then I'll be happy. So that's, that's dynamic equivalence. Modern versions don't attempt to translate word for word. Instead, the wording of Scripture is tailored to the receptor language. So you would be the receptor. You're the receiver of the language. So they translate the Bible in the receptor language. When I say translate, it's still, in English, it's still English. But instead of, just, instead of being the King James Bible, it's whatever makes you happy English. Whatever makes you comfortable English. The scripture is tailored to the receptor language in order to try and make the same concepts come across. So, for example, in the, in the 1611 edition, the question was, uh, was what was being translated? Now pay attention to this. What was being translated back in 1611? What was being translated? Today, the question is not what is being translated. It's, it's who is it being translated for? Who is it tra dynamic? Who is it, who is it being translated for? And this leads to wishes and preferences of receiving people being incorporated into the Word of God. The words are the key to the Scripture, and so heavy theological lessons depend on having an accurate translation. Let me give you a good example, real quick. We'll just touch on this. I got other examples that we'll look at later. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Verse 20. I think everybody's familiar with this story. This is this is right at the end uh, when Joseph um, and Jacob has has died. Joseph now, he's, he's, he's already identified to his brothers, hey, I'm Joseph, the one that you sold into slavery. And they were now worried that he was going to execute them because their father was now gone, so he's going to take revenge. And this is what he says in Genesis, in the King James Bible, in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. But as for you, you thought it evil against me, but God meant it to good, meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is in this day, to save much people alive. Now compare that to the NIV, or to the, I'm sorry, the New Living Translation, and it says this. As far as I'm concerned, God turned it into good, what you meant for evil. He brought me to the high position I have today so I could save the lives of many people. Now it's kind of like it, but it's not. You know why? Because it takes out what God did. It takes out completely. He says, he says in, in, in the KJV, to... That God, meant, that God meant it for, to, for good to pass as it is this day. To, to, to God meant it good so that he could save missed people alive. But in, in the New Living Translation, it says that, that uh, Joseph is the one that saved many lives. Yes, sir.
sacrificing accuracy and doctrine for readability. Yeah, I mean, that reads kind of comfortably, but it's for doctrine. So as far as I'm concerned, the phrase matches nothing in the Hebrew text and makes the statement a mere opinion rather than a statement of fact. As far as I'm concerned, as far as Joseph was concerned, God did this for me so I could be the hero and save people. But that's not what it is. This in itself is an important change in the meaning of the verse. And the phrase, he brought me to the high position I have today, that's been inserted in the NLT version. That concept is not even found in the, uh, in the King James Bible. The phrase, so that I could save lives of many people, attributes the outcome uh, to the will of Joseph rather than to the will of God. But especially notice the phrase, God turned, meaning to be, he acted on external events. God turned. So in at least four ways, this one little verse, the use of dynamic equivalence, obliterates an important theological concept that shines through the King James Bible literal trans translation. So, a, um, so I, don't, I didn't think I was going to be there yet. I thought I had a couple more things to fill out. See if I can find them real quick. I want to skip this for just a moment. We'll come back to all of this. It'll take time. Nope, I guess I don't. Oop, I stopped it. Now I can't get it started again. Could you guys restart my PowerPoint? I, I'm a fast trigger on the button there. Okay, I don't know where that's at. Uh, let's back up. Okay, we'll go back here. The guys in Shepherds or in HBI, they just love this. I do this to them all the time. Okay, let me get to where dynamic equivalence, Genesis. Okay, we'll just stop right there. Okay. You guys have blanks regarding um, the reconstruction of different basic tests? Of, okay, so the, the, the first blank is textual criticism. I don't know what that is on my slides, but I probably did something to it. The next blank is scholarship being regarded as more important than spirituality. These are the five factors of the problems with the new translations. Um, the, the, first, the second one is scholarship. The third one is Anglicism, I said that earlier, and I can't say it now. Anglicization, <laughs> okay, I wish it was on the screen so you could just, Anglo, Ang, and that works. And the fourth one is adaptation. Adaptation simply means that, that they, they make a Bible to fit the person they're trying to write the Bible for. Is that it? Okay, they found it on my screen, thank you. So it's, all the blanks are up there. Hopefully you can read that. Yeah, textual criticism, scholarship, Anglicization, adapting, and then ecumenical translations. The pro number five is ecumenical. Now, what does that mean? That means that they've gone out and they've gotten a bunch of, bunch of uh, different denominations together and they've hashed out, okay, let's make this verse say this. And then some of it is doctrinally accurate. Some of it is their own wrong doctrine. So anyway... This is where I want to be, right here. If everybody's got that down, I'm going to move on. Okay. I can click faster than you can write, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, I want to show you where this issue of dynamic equivalency comes from. I want to introduce you to a man that you probably have never heard of, but he has messed your Bible up. Okay, we ready? Okay, the purpose of a translation... Now, this is not in your notes, so just, just, just flow with me here. The purpose of a translation is to communicate from an author in one language to a translator, to a reader in another language by means of a message. So when you translate something, even if it's verbal, you're, there's, there's a communicator, there's somebody that's trying to speak and it needs to be translated to somebody that can receive it. Modern communication theory says that it is a process that occurs within a total culture. And this is all philosophical type stuff, but there, the message is not static, but the message itself must, must change. This is, this is the view of dynamic equivalence. The message itself must change relative to the culture being addressed. Today, in translation efforts, modern man follows what's called situational truth or ethics. 
that, that big fancy word ethics. Right, right and wrong are determined to be relative to the situation so that in some situation it's right to do wrong and it's wrong to do right. This was the view of a man. I don't know. If, I think he's up here. I don't know. Let's see. Yeah, there he is. This is the view of this man here. His name is Eugene Nida, N-I-D-A. He is the former translation research coordinator for the United Bible Societies. And he was there. He was in that role for 30 years from 1946 until 1980. He was the executive secretary of the translation department of the, of the American Bible Society as well. In 1943, he began his career as a linguist. So he went to college, got to be a linguist. I don't know why, but he did. Uh, he became a linguist with the American Bible Society, and he, he was quickly promoted to the associate secretary of versions. So he's in charge of the versions that the ABS is going is to produce. Then he worked as the executive secretary for translations until he retired. So NIDA was instrumental in the engineering, the joint effort between the Vatican and the United Bible Societies. He's the one that said, hey, you know, Vatican, UBS, let's get together and see what we can produce. It was, his, it was his desire to do that. This work began in 1968 and was carried on until, until um, in, in accordance with his plan um, called, of a principle called functional eloquence. We won't get into that, functional equivalence. But he was the most influential person in the field of Bible translating in our time. He believed that newer translations of the Bible were needed today because of our altered view of communication. The King James translators knew that, it was, that there was a linguistic difference between Hebrew and English. Wouldn't you agree with that? There's a difference between Hebrew and English. However, that difference between Isaiah's Jewish audience of, 17, of 760 B.C. and the English reader of 17th century was ignored in the King James Bible. They just wrote what the Bible said. They didn't, they didn't twist it. The King James translator didn't twist the Bible to make it fit 1611. They just translated the Bible. And you have to adjust your life according to the Word of God. We don't adjust the Bible. We don't adjust the, the Word of God to fit your life. That's what he wanted to do, though. So, Nida believed communication is only possible when the concepts are brought into the modern culture. According to Nida... Somebody's struggle, like Jacob's struggle with the angel in Genesis chapter 38. Remember when he was, he was escaping his brother and he, he went to sleep and he, he had his dream and the angel, with the angels coming down the ladder? So he, he, he said that that was not literal, but being interpreted by a writer psychoanalytically and method, or, or, mythology, or by mythology, his view was the translation should never be simplified to the words of the message. In other words... What was needed was not a formal or a static equivalence. What was needed was a dynamic equivalence, the same concept that we've already talked about. And that's the difference between viewing the Bible as an absolute standard and accepting the philosophy that all truth is relative. Because if you believe that all truth is relative, then you have to look at the Bible and say, well, the Bible is relative. Do we say that the Bible is true? Well, is it true absolute or is it true relative? Absolute. Absolutely is true absolute. So there's some facts about absolute uh, truth. Um, and I wish you had the notes of this, and I apologize. It's, I thought this was in there, but maybe it's not. The fact of absolute truth. We are able to critique the entire situation surrounding modern Bible translations from the Word of God based on three things. And so you can just make a note of this. There's three things that are, we stand in the way of knowing which the Bible is right. The first one is that there is an enemy. 2 Corinthians 11.13 says, For such are false apostles deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. It's been evident since 1856 that Satan has been attempting to corrupt the words of God just like he did back in Genesis. So the King James Bible was in, it was the, the, the Bible of 1856, had been almost 200 years, a little over 200 years. And then the re revised version came out in 1881. So in 1856, he, Satan started working on translating the Bible into a different form. So first, there's an enemy. Second, there, there are, you can be, you can be assured that there, there are wholesome words in the Bible. 1 Timothy 6, 3, if any man teach otherwise, it consent not to wholesome words. There are, the Bible has wholesome words. They're valuable words. They're important words. They mean something. And the third thing about the facts of absolute truth is that there are faithful words 
containing sound doctrine in the Bible. Titus chapter 1 verse 9 says, holding forth, I'm sorry, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So you have to have, you have to hold on to the faithful word so that you can be able to, by sound doctrine, demonstrate what God is looking for. Acts chapter 11, verse 14 says, Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? And in 1 Corinthians 2, 13, there's another verse, it says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. That's 1 Corinthians 2, 13. So remember your definition of inspiration. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. means that God gave the words, not just his thoughts. God gave his words, not just his thoughts. Okay, so let's see. I mean, I'm going to make a move here. Okay, so let's talk about some, some, of, the, some of these. So, you know, that's a good foundation for you to have some starting points. Now, there are some arguments against the King James Bible that it really don't have anything to do with how it was translated. So I want to talk about those just real quick. Uh, do we have God's word? That's what we want to know. Do we, do we want to know that? So... Um, to see, do we have God's word? I think that's your first blank. So God uses the universal language of the era. So, so it's an amazing thing. God wrote the, the Old Testament in Hebrew. He wrote the New Testament in Greek, and then he translated the Bible for everybody to speak in English. But the question would be, is there, can, can, trans, can, can a word for word translation work? Can't, can, can't we translate word for word into any language? I don't. I don't. I only speak one word, but I know Sharon speaks at least two di two different languages. But there's not a word for word translation between English and Spanish, right? I mean, sometimes you have to say two or more words to translate the English, or or two or more words in English to translate the Spanish, and and they're all in different orders and stuff like that. Um, so can't we can't we tra can we translate word for word? The original is a translation. We've talked about this already. Um, the original is a translation because it was translated from God to man. Moses spoke in Egyptian. We talked about that, but, but he wrote in Hebrew. The King James Bible lets you know that, you know, why are the, why are the words italicized? And, it, you know, there's no other Bible that I'm aware of that uses the italicization of the words. You know what that represents? It represents the words that, that, the, that the translators had to insert to maintain continuity of the passage, and they put it in trans they put it in italics so that you know that they added that word. They're not trying to deceive you. Other other Bibles will take the verse and the, the italicized word in the King James Bible. They don't italicize it in the in that version of the Bible. They just make it look like it's just the word. Okay, another question then would be, um, which line did it come from? Is older not better, or is older not better? Um, I think I'm out of my own secrets here. Older is not always better. Older is older, but older is not always better. So... Um, the question is about how old can a manuscript be before it's no, no good. Uh, and so a lot, of the, a lot of manuscripts that have been found were pretty worn out because they had been used a lot. So that's a key to which, which, which manuscripts we would want to use. Another question would be, aren't there thousands of changes between the 1611 Bible and the one that you have today? You know, you actually don't have a 1611 Bible in your hand. You have a 1769 Bible. Now, how did we go from 1611 to 1769 and still be a valid Bible? Well, it's really simple. There were some changes that needed to be made. Um, if you've ever, I don't have it on my screen, but if you've ever, if you ever get a copy of a, of a, a text of the 1611 King James Bible, I always think about this. Moses, how do you spell Moses? Pardon? M-O-S-E-S. -E you know how the King James Bible spelled it in 1611? M-O-F-E-F. -E 
There's a lot of words that are different. So, so that's a change that was made. Didn't change the context, didn't change the text at all. We just changed the spelling. So between 1611 and, six, and 1769, there were alphabet changes. There were uh, corrections in the spelling because if you've ever put the text together in a, in a, in, to print a Bible, um, you make errors. You, know, you get, the, you get the, t the block turned upside down or backwards or not, you get them out of, out of order. So you got to correct all of that. Um, I don't have it in, in here, but I think between the 1611 and 1769, it was 112 errors or 112 changes. But the, the NIV has over 50,000 changes between the King James Bible and the NIV. That's an incredible difference here. What, what about the, what, why did the King James translators include the Apocrypha in the 1611 edition? That's a question a lot of people ask. Those are the books that were specifically related to uh, cir circumstances that were taking place during the time between the New Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, God didn't speak to man to, during those times. So those books, the translators, included it only for historical purposes, and that's why they put it between the Old Testament and the New Testament, so that we could know that they're separated. They're not, they didn't consider them Scripture. They didn't consider them the Word of God. King James translators included it for historical purposes, and they put a disclaimer noting that they were not inspired. And if they're not inspired, we talked about the word inspiration, and the God inspired, he put his word into man so that they could write it down. And so if they're not inspired, uh, then they're not valuable to us. So it didn't take long before they stopped printing them and adding them to it. Another question would be, don't we have access to much better evidence and authorities today than in 1611 because of greater discoveries? Basically, which line did it come from? As I said, earlier is better and so on. The King, King James translators had all the information they needed. They chose the text from Antioch. They used other translations that had already been produced in different languages that was valuable to them. Uh, the issue is really between God and Satan. Hmm? Two texts, two seeds, right. Okay, so last question is, what about all those archaic words? And I have a, I have a handout. I didn't bring it. I forgot about it uh, until I see this note here. I have a handout that, you know, with the thee and the thou and, and why does it end in E-T-H? Well, why do a lot of words end in E-T-H and so on? Basically, I can just say right now, the English language was that it is pinnacle. Basically, that means that the English language has degraded since 1611. Words may change usage, but they never change meaning. That's an important thing. Words can change usage, but they cannot change meaning. And so if I, um, I'll try to figure out a way to produce that handout and get it out to everybody, because it's really kind of a, it really helps how the, what, what the T-H-E-E -E versus T-H-O-W or O U, thee and thou, what do those represent? It's a better way to say you. You know, we say you all, y'all, or different things like that, meaning everybody, or I say you, meaning you, you, just one person, you. So in English, we use the same word for two different groups, you and you. Thou and thee sig signify very specifically. We're talking about thee, thee, or thou. So there's, a, there's some differences there for sure. Okay, so we only got about 20 minutes left. And what I wanted to do with this last time, in your notes, you have a, a table. I'm not going to go through that table, but I am going to go through some things about it. You have, um, what's the big difference? And you have two, three columns, KJV, KJV rendering, the new NIV rendering, and I didn't get to the ESV rendering put in there. But then um, in your handout, you also have a table let me see your handout real quick there. Thanks. So under change doctrines in modern translation. So this table right here. Okay, this one right here. So the way this works is the doctrine is listed on the left. The passage of scripture is next to it. And then the, NIV, the New King James, the Good News Bible, the NIV, the NAB, the Living Bible, the Jerusalem Bible, the NASV, the RSV, the AV, in the AV 1769. And so when you read across, like the virgin birth, 
found in Luke chapter 2, verse, 13, uh, verse 33. You see a PA, an FDP, an FDP, an FDP, a blank, an FDP, an FDP, blank, blank. And the next page over, FDP stands for fundamental truth has been attacked. A fundamental doctrine is being promoted. A false doctrine is being promoted. So the version, like uh, on number one, Luke chapter 2, verse 13, verse 33, under the NIV, it says FDP. FDP stands for a false doctrine is being promoted or a fundamental truth has been attacked. So you can look at that verse and go to the NIV and say, Oh, they attacked my doctrine here. Because you notice the King James Bible on either 1611 or 1769 is blank because there's no change in there. So that's how you would read that verse. And then on the next page where it says chart explanations, number one, it says the virgin birth in Luke 22:33 in the AV says Joseph and his mother. The corrupt version say his father and mother. Who's the father of Jesus? But that verse in, indicates his father and mother teaching that Joseph was the father. So now you can see, I mean, I don't know, what is there, 25, 27 different verses. And then there's tons of verses. This is just a small chart. So I'm here, give me this back here. I wanted to explain that before I go on. Because what I want to do is I just want to look at a few verses here. Uh, the first one is Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. Matthew chapter 6, verse 13 says, and, the, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The NIV here says, bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This whole section about the kingdom and the power and the glory is missing from the NIV. In the ASV, it says, and bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So it's very similar to the NIV. But it also is missing the, the, the kingdom and the power and the glory. The ESV, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And they still, so they took out the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Whoa, too fast. In Acts chapter 8, verse 37, this is about the Ethiopian eunuch. It says, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And, if he, answer, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. In the NIV, the words are missing, but there's a footnote that says some manuscripts include the words. What words? They don't tell you what words are included. In the ASV, it's the same as the King James Version. In the ESV, there is no verse 37. It goes verse 36, verse 38. Verse 37 is completely gone. It doesn't even exist in the ESV. What does that do? It removes the, the teaching of that you that baptism doesn't save, that you are saved by belief in Christ, not saved by baptism. Romans chapter 10, 14, verse 10, that Christ is God, judge of all. Kingdom, Romans chapter 14, but why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou sit it not of thy brother? For he, we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, in this room. In, the, in, the, in this, the, uh, the ASV, the RSV, the NASV, the NIV, the judgment seat of Christ is missing. And, but that identifies Jesus Christ as God, as, uh, as identifies Jesus Christ with God. You can go back to Isaiah 45, verse 23 to compare that. So they're removing the judgment seat of Christ and taking the, the judgment of Christ out of the picture. You are going to be judged by Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. The Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9 says, To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery for which all from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Christ Jesus, by Jesus Christ. That's omitted in the ASV, the RSV, the NASV, and pick an alphabet. The Douay Reims, that's the, King, that's the Catholic Bible. So by Jesus Christ is omitted. That, that, what that does is it removes Jesus Christ as the Godhead. Because Jesus Christ was involved in the creation. He, God created, we know, in the beginning God created. But Jesus Christ was part of that creation. He was there. So here, Hebrews chapter 1. I won't, take a, I won't read all that. You guys, I think these are not in your handout, but they're on that table. Um, let me go back here. So ma masking the religion of Satan in Revelation 4.18 
And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The NASV, uh, fallen has fallen, is Babylon the great, that's modified. And then uh, in a, in a, NIV, a second angel followed saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. This just changes everything. Um, Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 25, and, and, he knew, and, he, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. But the NIV, NIV says he gave him the name Jesus. Who gave Jesus his name? God did. Because God is the Father. But this, but this here makes it sound like Joseph gave him his name. Revelation 22, 19, which says, don't change the book. So NIV says, that if a person takes the words out of this scroll of prophecy, God will take away that person from any share in the tree of life. Doesn't mean you, have, you still have access, you just don't get share. ESV says, took away his share in the tree of life. There's no share up here, uh, his part maybe, I guess, but it's, it takes away the truth of who, who is going to lose out on, on the, the uh, tree of life. Romans chapter 1, the horror of sinfulness, without understanding covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. The New King James says, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. There's no covenant breaking there. Covenants are important because God made a lot of covenant promises with all of us. A, co a covenant, in case you don't know, is a promise, um, promise through shed blood. Jesus Christ died on, he, his, his promise of salvation was a covenant promise through his shed blood. Psalm 8, chapter, Psalm chapter 8, verse 5, the nature of Christ. Met him a little lower than the angels up here. The NASV says, a little lower than God. So does that mean that God and the angels are equal? What does that mean? You can't even make a doctrine out of that statement. Well, that's true. Thanks, Ron. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The NIV says, do your best. To present yourself as one approved, a workman who do, does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. The only, the only Bible that says to study is the King James Bible. There are no other Bibles that say the word study. They say, do your best. Well, my best and your best might not be the same best. So did I do my best or did I do your best or whose best did I do? Study to show yourself approved unto God. Don't just do your best to show yourself as one approved. Luke 4, 4, uh, that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of, of God. NIV says it is written, man does not live on bread alone. Yeah, where's the word? And so there's he, let's see what time is it. Yeah, we got to, let me do this one here. So who being the, come on, get the right button who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath by himself purged our sins. So in NIV, the sun is the radiance, the exact representation of his being, and he provided purification for sins. So it, when you read it, it might, when you just read it for the first time, it might sound like, well, that's, that's basically the same. But it starts out completely different, and it makes, it makes a complete mockery of who Jesus Christ really is. Revelation 4, 8, 14, 8. Um, so this talks about that great city and the wrath of, the, of her fornication. Um, NASV says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, who has made all the nations drink of the wine of, her, of the passion of her immorality. Fallen, fallen, NIV, is Babylon the great, maddening wine of her adulteries, and so on. 
those. It just twists the, the, the image that you get from the truth of the verse. Okay, I guess I've already been to that one. And I think that one too. And I, I, must, I must have some duplicates here. Is that, am I going backwards? I don't think so. I guess not. That's the end of it. Okay, so that's where we're going to end. Uh, if you want more, I um, mean, there's a lot of books in our library over here that you can check out that if you want to study on your own. Um, you can sign up for HBI. I don't think, I don't remember if it's this fall or next spring, but you can sign up for it, take the class. Um, you can take it. I would encourage you to take it as, as a credit class because if you're going to sit through my teaching, you might as well get credit for it. But if you don't take, if you don't take it as a credit class, you take it as an audit, you still have to pay. You still have to sit in a class. You just don't have to take the test. And the tests are really easy. Okay, does anybody got any questions about this? Yes. Really? Okay. My 67 and your 67 are different. Pardon? Okay, let me see. Roman numeral 11. Oh, man. I ch okay. I'm glad you know where we're at. I okay. I saw a couple other hands over there. It was all probably the same thing. I'm sorry. I do the best I can, and I change it all. So, any other questions? Well, I've, I mean, I've got a lot of thoughts about why churches have never used the King James Bible and why churches have left the King James Bible. Um, and I think a lot of churches don't use the King James Bible because when, um, when their pastor went to Bible college, that Bible college didn't teach out of the King James Bible. That's probably the biggest reason because he just took with him what he learned. The churches that have left the King James Bible, they did it for, what is the word? Um, to be practical, to try to meet, to try to meet the community. Pardon? Meet people where they are, which sounds great, but they, um, they leave the King James Bible because there's a lot of people that don't like the King James Bible because of some of the points that I went through. You know the 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 ancient the, ar the archaic words and different things. Um, the one of the things about the King James Bible is, is that I didn't mention is it if you if you uh, ran it through a, uh, a, a a test to see you know where does it rank in in the reading skills? It's like a seventh grade reading book. So it's not, and a lot of these other books, they're they're, they're even greater. Um, you know, 10th grade, which, I mean, it's still not bad if people made it through the 10th grade, but, you know, some people have problems with reading. But but churches leave the King James Bible because, um, gosh, I wish I could remember the word that I wanted to. If I could remember the word, it would just make total sense what I'm trying to say. Prag yeah, that's the word, pragmatic. They they did it for pragmatic reasons. They were just, they, they wanted to appease the people they were trying to reach Oh, we don't use the King James Bible. We make things easy for you. Come on in. And people come in because they want it to be easy. They don't know that they're missing out on doctrine because they don't know the Bible. So um, when they come to a church like this and they hear these things that we teach, 
many people are just completely at awe about they can understand the Bible. Because I was one of them when I first went to church and I uh, started hearing them unpack the Bible and explain a verse. I was like, wow, I can see what they're saying. It makes total sense. And so uh, that's why a lot of people leave. You know, some of it is what they were trained with to begin with. So they take what they were trained with and some of them change because they're trying to be pragmatic. Thanks for the word. Well, a lot of that is because of their doctrines to begin with. They have doctrines that don't line up with their Bible, so they don't want to teach their Bible because then it would, conf it would conflict with their doctrinal position. So I do know that that's a fact. I mean, that's one of the reasons the Catholic Church doesn't want their members to read the Bible. Even in the Dewey Reams Bible, if they read it, they'll find out that a lot of the things that are being taught don't match up with what the Bible says. And they can't have that. That's what Martin Luther did. Martin Luther read the Bible and said, I got 95 errors here that I need an answer for. And uh, they didn't like that. And some people in the Catholic Church doesn't, I know Julie went to Catholic school. And uh, when she had a question about something, especially with a religion question, she's got her hand smacked. Like, don't ask any questions. Just listen to what we're telling you. Accept it. So anyway... There's probably a lot of different reasons for almost for every person. There's a reason why they use what they use. Um, they're afraid of the King James Bible. It's got all these fancy, all these difficult words, the these, the thous, and, you know, and the concepts are weird. And there's, there's words that don't make sense. I mean, that's why we have a dictionary. You know, I mean, the English language is that way. There's words in the English. I don't know what that means. And I got to look it up in a dictionary. You know, thank goodness I can go quickly on my phone and get to a dictionary now. But, um, they're just afraid. So anything else? Okay, well, it's been enjoyable. I'm, I hope it would make sense. I went through some things I did change on you. One of these days I will learn not to do that. Um, but uh, I'm always looking to try to improve. So, Okay, well, let's pray and then we'll be out of here. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for... Uh, the opportunity to teach this topic, even though it was a, brev a brief, talk, brief topic uh, to, to go through a lot of, well, we did cover a lot of ground, even though it was brief. I pray, Father, that it would make sense. I pray that everything that, that everybody here got would be valuable for them. And uh, just thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.